Someone once said that peonies are the showgirls of the spring garden, but with dahlias, it's all about late summer, early fall royalty. You will learn about the history of the discovery of the dahlias and their introduction into the American garden. You will learn how to select dahlia tubers, where to plant, how to water and fertilize, to stake or not to stake, to dig or not to dig. These are the questions. If you dig tubers, how to store, overwinter, and then how to wake them up and perhaps make cuttings. Let's get started. So good morning, my name is Betsy Simzak, and I live in Natick, and my next door neighbor across the street neighbor, Mary Fran, is here, that's great. Uh, welcome, uh, today is a kind of a dreary day, it's gonna be a dreary weekend, and there's nothing better than looking at pictures of flowers, particularly at this time of year, to talk about dahlias, because you will be able to, after we finish, go some buy great dahlias here at um, Weston, and uh, you have to be a little patient, though. Uh, it's still pretty raw and cold out, so you can't put your dahlias out until the soil gets to be about 60 degrees. I'm hoping that comes sooner than later. Uh, you never know. So anyway, this is a picture of my garden, um, and I love to grow dahlias. And you might say, really? Why is that? And when you look at these blooms, it's, it's a pretty easy sell. I also love to grow begonias, and that's a whole other story. So in the back, I have... Um, a uh, list of all my garden club presentations and something about begonias. So I got into this garden lecturing. Uh, I, I taught for 35 years at Bunker Hill Community College, Northeastern Fitchburg State, as a clinical microbiologist. So I got into this Dahlia lecture uh, after I got into the begonia lecturing. And it's really fun to talk about both. So um, this, uh, I devote an awful lot of space in my garden to dahlias because I love them so much. Uh, Mary Fran will tell you I'm having a big renovation done in my backyard and I've got me two or three hundred square feet again devoted to dahlias so I'm excited about that. Uh, and these are, uh, this is a bouquet of dahlias that I picked to take to some other event and this is again why I grow dahlias. They are just gorgeous and they're relatively easy to grow. So 2019 is actually the year of the dahlia, according to the National Garden Bureau, which is pretty cool. Uh, I'm surprised that it took that long, um, but I think that there's a big resurgence in growing any kind of cut flower that's home, homegrown. You've heard of the slow food movement. There's the slow flower movement where you try to source your flowers as locally as possible. It's also the year, Pantone does a color of the year, you may be aware of that, and it's also the color of the year is living coral. And if you want coral flowers, there are literally hundreds of dahlias that are coral colored. I just sourced a dahlia from the state where I grew up, uh, Connecticut, called Connecticut Coral. I'm really excited to, uh, to grow that um, plant. So we have to do a little bit of history and a little bit of botany in order to get to uh, t talking about growing in your garden. And I used uh, this map to illustrate where you will find dahlias uh, growing naturally in the environment. You'll notice they do not grow naturally in New England. So you'll find dahlias in uh, Mexico, Central America, a little bit of South America. Uh, there are approximately 38 uh, species of dahlias uh, in, uh, in the wild, and the dahlias that we grow, these dahlias here, are all hybrids from uh, those species. So these are the dahlias that the Spanish explorers first recognized or first found when they were uh, exploring Central South America, the Caribbean, and um, they uh, actually came back with drawings. They did not come back with the plants. And the color, the drawings were usually black and white. Someone later on did some color. So this is from 1791. And you know, during the 1700s, there was a huge European exploration all over the world. And they would go everywhere and come back with whatever they thought was worthwhile. And it usually was gold. But a lot of explorers also uh, had botanists with them who came back with plants and descriptions of plants. So you know that dahlias make tubers. And at one time, the folks that did the exploration thought that this might be a good potato substitute. No, not really. So uh, then when they realized that these had a tremendous uh, blossom capacity, uh, the uh, European kings <coughs> tried to outdo each other with their gardens. 
And so when you talk about begonias, it's the French kings. When you talk about dahlias, it's the Spanish kings that uh, did most of the dahlia or early hybridizing. So this, uh, these flowers look a little bit like dahlias, but what's unique about these is that they have an open center. Uh, and maybe eight petals, maybe 16 petals, nothing that looks like this today. And one of the reasons for this, and this is really interesting, just, again, a little bit of botany. You all know that humans have, you've heard of 23andMe? So that means that you have 23 pairs of chromosomes? Well, dahlias don't have pairs of chromosomes. They have sets of eight. They are what they call octoploidy. They have a huge amount of genetic material. And they also have something called jumping genes or transposons. So from those 36 um, species, we have approximately 54,000 hybrids. So this all has to do with the genetic reassortment. And it's a, it's a hybridizer's delight to be able to um, make new species. Another botanical feature is that these plants, um, unlike begonias, well, some begonias, or tomato plants, they make tubers. Um, most plants that we think about make uh, fibrous roots. And these tubers have lots of function. Um, they are storage devices. And if you harvest a tuber and take care of it, and you harvest it the right way, and I'll talk about that, you will be able to take this tuber, preserve it over the winter, and plant it and get exactly that same plant. If, however, you decide to grow dahlia seeds, so these are dahlia seeds that I started a couple of months ago, you're not really going to know what you're going to get. This is essentially what they call a non-uniform cross. So it's kind of fun that dahlia hybridizers actually collect seeds, they do hybridizing, they plant hundreds of seeds, and then from that they maybe get one or two uh, excellent um, uh, dahlias. So dahlias also belong to the Compositae family, or their Asteraceae family. They, they look like asters and zinnias and calendulas and all the rest. So they belong to a very large family of plants. So why am I showing you this tomato if I'm talking about dahlias? The reason why is because if you can grow tomatoes, you can grow dahlias. They really pretty much take the same requirements. Now, tomatoes are an annual uh, plant. You plant them, uh, frost comes, you take them down, and then next year you have to do new seeds. Uh, dahlias are also annual, but a little bit different. So tomatoes and dahlias. So what do they need to grow? Well, they need sun. They need at least six hours of sun. Morning sun is preferable. Afternoon shade is also prefer preferable. Do you remember how hot last summer was? That was not a great summer for dahlias because it got so hot. In fact, people who compete for in dahlia shows, and I'm one of those people, but at a very low level, will oftentimes erect shade cloth over their dahlias or even umbrellas. You'll see, you go into a garden, you see all these beach umbrellas set up because they don't want that hot afternoon sun uh, to fry their, their dahlias. The soil should be well drained, so you should have a lot of compost. Um, and a pH of about 6.5, and that's pretty much what your, if you have a vegetable garden, that's what your vegetable garden will be. Uh, you can amend your uh, garden with compost, which is, uh, I, I like to do. But because you want really robust, beautiful blooms, it's a good idea to fertilize a couple times during the season. So when I was uh, working, setting up yesterday, uh, we went through the shop and we picked up uh, fertilizer that would be appropriate the most important thing to remember if you're going to use fertilizer is that you want to use a fertilizer. You all know with fertilizer, it's got three numbers. So that's N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, potassium. So you want your N first number to be lower than the rest. So that's 5105, that works well. 51010, that works well. You want the plant to put its energy into making flowers, not making foliage, which is obviously makes a lot of sense. Now the other really interesting thing about these tubers is if these tubers get too wet, they rot. So typically when you plant your tomatoes, you plant your tomatoes, you side dress a little bit of fertilizer, and then you drench them with water. Don't do that with your dahlia because what will happen is the dahlia tuber could rot. And what's really sad, I always have a few dahlias uh, ready to go if we get really heavy rain after um, I plant. 
sometimes the, some of the smaller tubers won't make it uh, because of that. But that doesn't mean that they don't need water. Once your dahlia gets to be about this height, you're going to want to water it. Um, I use soaker hoses. Um, and uh, you know, if you don't have any natural rain, maybe you want to water an inch a, inch a week. Um, so that's about it. Uh, someone asked me the last time I gave this talk, when do you plant them? So when do you plant your tomatoes? Memorial Day, OK? So that's, you can plant your dahlias at the same time, Memorial Day. Uh, again, the soil, shoots. it's really interesting. I went to the Boston Flower Show uh, in March and I was talking to some, there are some new dahlia vendors, people who are actually local sources of seeds, Hudson seed and um, fruition seeds. They're now selling dahlia tubers that they claim are good for the Northeast and that if you plant them by May 15th that you will have bloom by July 15th. Um, I don't know if my soil is going to be 60 degrees in May 15th. So I, I would really use that uh, as a, uh, you, you're really anxious to get them out. But you know that um, if, you, if you hurry it up, it may not work out uh, too well. So where are you going to get your tubers? Well, you've got tons of opportunities to buy tubers. You can come to Western Nurseries. And I have to tell you that... Um, when I went through the store on Thursday and picked these up, I was really impressed with the selection of varieties that they have here. Uh, oftentimes, you'll buy tubers from Home Depot. Nothing wrong with these. Or Lowe's. Nothing wrong with these. But these are Dutch hybrids that have not made it into the American Dahlia Society classification book. And I want to show my dahlias. So I want a dahlia that's in this book. That doesn't mean you can't show a dahlia that's not in the book. And almost all of the dahlias that they have here have been recognized by the American Dahlia Society. And that's, that is sort of a seal of approval, that these dahlias have been shown to be uh, very reliable uh, growing in the garden. So kudos to Weston for, for having a, a terrific selection. You can go to the flower show, the Boston flower show, the Philly flower show, the Connecticut flower show. They were all selling dahlias. Uh, if you look at that uh, handout that I had with all the links, I've listed all the places where I bought my dahlias. Too many dahlias, too many websites, too much money. But I did that when I was recovering from foot surgery. And I was online. And I bought all my dahlias. I, bought, I ordered all my dahlias before Christmas uh, because I knew what I wanted. And some of these dahlias are hard to get. I am not saying you have to be like that. Don't be like that because it really gets complicated. You can go to Lowe's and Home Depot, and they they have. I've, I Ocean State has really done a great. I've gotten some great dyes there. So if you are hesitant and you don't want to invest in uh, an eight or nine dollar dahlia, go to Home Depot and get a bag and see how it works. Uh, I've had some great luck with that, uh, but you never know what you're going to get. So when you buy a bag from Ocean State, it says pink and uh, red dahlias or purple and plum dahlias. So you have no idea what they are, and they're not named. And again, I'm at a point where I want to know the name of the dahlia that I grow. Local dahlia societies. So there are, a, a, well, I'll list all the dahlia societies in a minute, but all of them have tuber sales. So you all, you know, you all know where Tower Hill Botanical Garden is? Tomorrow, the New England Dyer Society is having a tuber sale. And that's where you go to get the really unique stuff. Members who have decided, I want something a little bit out of the ordinary. So I would recommend that. So you plant mid-May to early June, again, when the soil is 60 degrees. And then there's a whole concept of support and staking. And a lot of people will say, I don't want to grow dyes because I don't want to the work of having to stake and I can understand that because that's a lot of work. But if you want a dinner plate dahlia, you got to do that. But as we go through the talk, we'll talk about some uh, breeding that the Dutch hybridizers have done where they've bred short dahlias that have long stem for flower arranging and even shorter dahlias that can be used for containers. So I'm here to tell you the dinner plates are great, but you don't necessarily have to have a dinner plate to have a beautiful uh, dahlia. So uh, I've used stakes and tomato cages. There's this horizontal support. It's a kind of a, a large a mesh netting. And with my new garden, I think I'm going to try, I'm going to try that. Uh, again, there's no 
or there's no one size fits all. Everybody adjusts their gardening practice to their garden, their time, their space. Uh, it's, it can be very individualized. So don't go to this website, dieaddict.com, because if you do, you will get rid of your lawn and you will, my neighbor knows, <laughs> I've gotten rid of about half of my lawn. Uh, and uh, it basically, if there's a particular dye, so I wanted a Connecticut coral dye. So I hit the C tab, st st uh, scroll down, and I found that there's only two places that sell Connecticut coral dyes. One is in Hubbardston, Massachusetts. So I made a little field trip out there the other day. It was really fun to see this lady's garden, and uh, I'm hoping that that's a spectacular dahlia. It might not be. You never know. Okay, another uh, dahlia, uh, another plant catalog that I really like a lot is um, Old House Gardens. I don't know if you're, any of you are familiar with this. If you uh, are very interested in having heirloom period plants, uh, they have a great selection and they'll actually tell you the date when the uh, plant was uh, brought into commerce. So uh, my daughter is gardening in a small historical garden in Philadelphia. So I ordered her the only dahlia that is available from the 1880s, which is kind of cool that uh, that exists. Most of the dahlias here are hybrids of recent, you know, maybe the last 60 or 70 years. So I recommend this. And this little um, diagram comes from here. And it basically tells you that you can either buy chicken legs or pot roots. So this is what they call a chicken leg. Kind of looks like a chicken leg. I wouldn't want to eat it. Um, but this is a tuber. And I'll go into a little bit of discussion of what makes a tuber uh, a successful candidate for growing dahlias. Not every tuber will produce a dahlia. When you buy uh, dahlias from the big box stores, you'll get this. And this is called a pot root. And this kind of propagation is done almost exclusively in the Netherlands. And what they do is at the end of the growing season, in August or September, they'll take a tuber like this, they'll put it in a pot, and this obviously was a pretty small pot because it didn't really grow very big. They'll keep it in a greenhouse, they'll grow it over the winter, it will make tubers, then uh, probably in March, they'll pull the tuber out of the pot, dust off the soil, and put it in a bag and send it to the United States. So this is what's known as a pot root. You could do this. In fact, um, there's a resource here. I'll talk to you a little bit about garden books. But this is a 95-page a, a handout. It's listed on your uh, resources from the Colorado Dye Society that will tell you how to do everything. This book I love because of the pictures. But it's 90% pictures and only 10% how-to. So. Uh, I, I, I like to have both. Anyway, so you can, I'll pass this around. You can see that there's a, a sprout coming out of that tuber. Um, that is multiple tubers. And if, if they're a little bit larger, and if I had enough guts to do this, and I'm not giving this lecture again, I don't know when, I'm, I'm not giving it again this season, I could cut that apart and I would probably find more sprouts. So from that one, uh, pot root, I could probably get two or three uh, dahlia tubers. Um, so it all depends on, and, or you could just pop that in the soil and you'll have a great plant. Uh, okay. Would you say then that pot roots produce more flowers because there are more? Uh, well, yeah, well, you know, I, I've put both in the garden and I, I can't tell the difference. Okay. So a happy, <clears throat> a happy plant yes. is going to make lots of sprouts and make lots of flowers. Okay. As long as you've got the right growing conditions, it, okay. it doesn't There's matter. No not really, not really. I, I don't. I don't personally think so. Someone else may say I only, I only buy these. Okay. Um, but I, when I'm buying tubers, I'm buying for the variety, the color, the height, all yeah. that. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So here's a clump of tubers. This is the stem. Um, <clears throat> the tuber has a, a anatomy, which I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, what the, but essentially when you um, are going to plant a tuber or separate tubers, you want to make sure that you have these eyes. And these eyes will be, I'll pass this around, you can see that the tuber has started to grow and I've got two sprouts. 
and that is going to be the source of the plant. What's very important is that when you do your dividing or buying or cutting, that you get, so this is the tuber, this is the neck, and this area here is called the crown. Sometimes tubers will come, uh, sprouts will come from the stem, but if you don't have any crown, so for example, in this bag, I have a tuber that doesn't have a crown, and I'm gonna put this in the compost because there's no way that that's gonna make a flower because it does not have, um, it does not have a crown. Oh, I've got a great uh, couple of slides that will show you that. So I buy um, the, the sort of the premier place. To, some of you who grow dyes have probably got, grown from Swan Island. This is the place that I order from. You look at that glossy magazine. It's pretty fancy. Yeah, they actually used to charge for that catalog. I think I bought so much I don't have to pay anymore. Um, and they're very professional. Um, they come all packed in peat moss, and you'll notice that, that they all have sprouts. They look very good, they're nice and firm. Uh, you can't really see this here, but they actually stamp the name of the uh, dahlia on the tuber so that you um, uh, know exactly what you've got. One of the big things is that this tuber and this tuber, they, I wouldn't know what's what. If, I, if you don't label, so this is called Alpen Cherub. I would not know this from any other dahlia. So labeling becomes extremely important if you're going to save your dyes. Or if you don't care, you know, just throw them in the garden. It's, it's up to you. Um, so this is the uh, Swan Island. And then this is another uh, company, I think, out of Montana. They not only package them beautifully, but they give you a picture and a description. And it's packed nicely. And it's not that expensive. Um, and then sometimes you get the mom and pop. This was, uh, you know, the, when you go to the grocery store and they have the um, bags for produce. It was, so it was packed in a produce bag and actually looked a little kind of shriveled, but you know what? Everything grew. So, you know, don't throw away a tuber unless you're really sure that it's uh, shriveled. And I'll show you where to go to figure that out. All right, so the local tuber sales. Uh, the Connecticut Dye Society has one on April 28th in Hartford. Rhode Island has one on May 5th in Wickford, and New England Dye Society has one tomorrow <clears throat> and, and one on June 1st at Tower Hill. I belong to all of these groups, uh, and um, it's really fun to go. And do I need any more tubers? Of course not, but you know, there's just something there you just have to have. All right, so I've passed around a tubers that are in pots, and you'll say, wait a minute, Why'd you do this? Um, didn't you say you can't put them out until it's 60 degrees? And that's true. But you can get a start on the season. So if I can plant a plant that big when it's time, then I may get my dyes a little bit earlier. Uh, but this requires space. I grow them under lights. Um, and it's a bit of a commitment. So what I'm saying to you is you do not have to do this. One benefit from, from doing this is that when I, uh, I think now that I'm finished talking for a while, you see that there are two sprouts here? I am going to go home and I'm going to take a cutting. So I'm gonna cut one of these sprouts and get a little bit of crown, put it in some potting medium, put it in a Ziploc bag so it stays moist. In two weeks it will make roots. And now from one tuber, I'll have two plants. And I will not be able to tell the difference between, uh, by the end of the summer, they'll all be uh, pretty great. Where do you keep the, uh, the, the bag when you do that? Do you put it in the cold? Or in oh, the no, bag? I keep it under lights with, every, with everything else. So in I have it in a bag, yeah. You wanna, anytime you take a cutting for any plant, the plant really gets a shock when you cut its roots off. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, the good idea is to keep it in a humid environment so that um, it will put its energy into making roots. So, that, uh, so that, that's a fun thing to do, but then you don't have to do that. Um, there are some people, I know uh, I have a friend who <clears throat> uh, has a floral business on the side and she does weddings. So her bride says, I want cafe au lait, I want this, I want that. So she'll, will dr she'll grow four different dyes, but she'll grow 10 of each so that she'll have the dyes ready for the, ready for the wedding. 
So here they are getting ready. Again, labeling is really important. And here is, is the knife that's used to cut the dahlia. Also, too, I don't like to talk about all the problems associated with dahlias because I don't want to disturb, discourage anybody. But there, there are the people out who study this uh, academically in the West Coast uh, have come to the conclusion that there is a, a problem with dahlias and virus. And um, one of the ways that I can control that is by when I um, look at this, I don't see a virus infecting this dahlia. I, had, I bought about 10 last year from two suppliers that had virus, and I didn't plant those dahlias because I didn't want all my other dahlias to get virus. It's a very difficult problem to deal with, um, and it, you shouldn't be discouraged because sometimes a dahlia will be infected with a virus, and you won't know it. Uh, it won't have signs. Uh, and sometimes a, a, a virus will just fail to thrive. So here's a light system. Here's what it looks like under lights. And again, it's a, um, again, it takes space and it takes time. If you don't have the space and you don't have the time, then you can do this. And that is take the tuber when it gets warm enough, dig a hole. Now notice these have, all have eyes. You want the eyes to be up and the sprouts to be up. Dig a hole, plant the tuber four inches deep. Cover it up, don't water it. Figure out if you need a stake, how you're gonna stake. If you're gonna stake, it's a good idea to put the stake in the soil when you put the tuber in the soil because uh, you may not know exactly what, if you put the tuber here and you put the stake here, you could cut off some of the tuber, so it's a better idea to put the stake here. So that, that's a, a little tip that people follow. All right, so then there's pinching and staking. So we talked about staking. If you are growing dahlias for competition, you oftentimes will grow a single stalk with a single flower. And why would you do that? You want that flower to be big and perfect. The problem is, is that you don't have anything else uh, to enjoy. Uh, and uh, what if uh, thrips gets into that flower? So people who are really uh, most dye societies have what they call challenge flowers. So I just found out the other day the challenge flowers for New England and Rhode Island. And some people will, t will plant five or six of those challenge flowers so that they will have one perfect blossom. Also in competition, they will sometimes uh, have a, a triplet competition where you submit three flowers. And the idea is if you can grow three perfect flowers, that means you're better than someone who can grow one perfect flower. <laughs> and even, I've been to some shows where they have seven and nine competitions. I'm not doing that. Um, also, too, if you want a lot of flowers for flower arranging and bouquets, the recommendation is that you, when you have three sets of leaves, so once this gets to be a little bit higher, if you pinch the center, it will become bushier, just like pruning any or pinching any other plant. And that will give you more flowers. So less flowers, pinch everything off the sides, more flowers, pinch the top, and you will uh, get more flowers. All right, so after you've done all that, you can enjoy your dahlia garden, which is something that I enjoy. I love cut flowers, so this is a bouquet that I just threw together. There's no, I'm not a design person. Put them in a vase, looks good to me, I'm happy. But I love this design. So if you go to a Dahlia show, and we'll talk about Dahlia shows in a minute, um, they will have competitions for floral arrangement. And this design I particularly like. There are a bunch of Dahlias and uh, ornamental grass, but I told you I'm a begonia addict as well. And this is a begonia called Begonia grandis. It's the only begonia that will grow as a perennial in New England. So this begonia is native to China. And you buy, uh, buy a plant, it makes a tuber. You can put it in your perennial garden where you'd put your hostas or your helibores or sort of shady. The problem with this is, is that this is candy for voles and chipmunks. So my begonia grandis lives in a pot. Um, I, can't, I can't put it out because it'll get eaten up. But if you've got a place, I highly recommend um, that you try to source Begonia Grandis. And there is a, a New England source. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Avant Garden in Dartmouth. It's a wonderful, down by um, New Bedford, just 
I think east of New Bedford, a wonderful garden center that um, sells all kinds of very unique plants. And they do, I've bought Begonia Grandis many times from them. It's a really a great place. Anyway, I just love that design. Um, that I love too, but certainly there's, wouldn't win any prizes. All right, and then what happens? October, November, you get frost and everything dies. And uh, if I had remembered to save the seed head, that would have been good, but I didn't. Um, but there are going to be seeds in the seed head. I actually bought seeds uh, to, to start these. Um, but I, I have a, there's a, a woman who lives in Needham. Her name is Joyce Sterling. She's 88 years old, and she's a dahlia hybridizer. And she has, she has about a half dozen dahlias in this uh, book. And she has... Um, she says, yep, that's what you just do, and she, she's been doing it for years, and it's very, it's remarkable uh, what she can do. So you've got this. What can you do? Well, you can take everything and put it in the compost. You don't have to dig unless you want those same dyes for next year. So I, I basically look at the cost-benefit ratio where, you know, I bought... Um, you go to Russell's and you buy, and I don't know uh, what their system here is, but Russell's, you can buy a large six pack of annuals for six or seven dollars. Well, for six or seven dollars, you can just buy a brand new tuber. So uh, if you don't want to go, if you don't have the time to go through the digging, don't worry about it. Uh, or if, let's say, you only have three dyes that you really love, save those and put the rest in the compost. Um, but if you do want to dig, and overwinter, you use a, a spading fork to dig up the tubers, and then um, probably about a week before you um, do, uh, do the digging, you cut the tops off. And the dahlia stem is hollow, so you really want to be very careful when you uh, do this that you cut the uh, stem far enough down so that it's solid. Because what will happen is water will collect in that hollow stem, and that will cause rot. And that's the big problem when you're trying to save your uh, dahlia tubers is rot. So cut your stem back to about here, and then you won't have to uh, worry about that. So here, this is what I do. Um, there's also, uh, some people will have an air compressor and blow the, <laughs> blow the soil. I, I'm not going to do that. Um, but uh, that process works very well. So these are the, the dyes and flower pots in my backyard. And uh, you can see there's a little bit of hollow there from the, the stem. And you'll notice what's kind of fun is that this is the mother tuber. This is the tuber that I planted. And you might say, how do you know? It's got the name of the tuber on it. So some really amazing magic marker. <laughs> I don't know what they use. I use them um, Sharpie Extreme which works, I think maybe that might be Sharpie Extreme. So that's kind of great. Most of these, you can see I have a tag in here that tells, tells me what it is, but here I didn't have to tag it because the name was uh, on the tuber. So then you have a couple choices. You can, in the fall, what I do is I dig, I rinse, and I turn them upside down to drain any water out of the stem, and within 24 to 48 hours, I separate my um, tubers. What some people do is they dig dirt and all, put them in a paper bag, put them in the garage, put them in the basement, and they deal with the dividing in the spring. I would prefer to do the dividing in the fall just because I've got so many, um, I've got a space, uh, space issue. So this, I, I have this link on your website. This is the coolest, this just, I found this a couple weeks ago. This uh, dahlia grower from Summer Dream Farm in Michigan has a whole program on how to divide tubers. And he basically said that if you want a tuber to be good, it should be larger than a AA battery. That's what that is. And that uh, he also said that you have to have, you notice that the tips are cut off and there's no hairy bits. You see the hairy tiny roots? Cut all that off, you don't need that. And in fact, there are some dahlia growers who will say, Cut the dahlia right here. You don't need all that extra storage. You've got the storage here. Shouldn't rot. Um, there's an amazing dahlia grower in Connecticut who says, well, you know, a fat tuber is a lazy tuber. 
I don't know about that. But anyway, I, uh, I, I don't do that, but I do clean up my tubers um, so, they, so they look like this. And so the idea is, is that you want to have an, an area where there will be a sprout. And if that is the reason why that, uh, why this isn't, has to go in the compost, because there is no neck and there will be no crown and there will be no sprout. So this, I thought, I thought to myself, can I do this? How did he do this? Was it spray paint, uh, craft paint? So this fella took a tuber uh, and he, this is the actual tuber. The purple is the neck and the pink is the crown. So you notice there's no stem. So everybody says you've got to keep some of the stem, but really you've got to keep the crown. And that is where the sprout is going to come from. So that's why this isn't any good. There's no neck or no crown. So I recommend going, if you're interested, going to this website. It's really, really fun. And then this also shows you, uh, he did another thing where he separated again the, um, this is the, where the, where the uh, neck ends and where the crown begins. So all of this area is the crown and this is the stem that's pretty much gone. Uh, and here he shows you how to make a cut. So uh, I'll pass my chicken leg around. I'll pass these, this around, you can see. You can take it out of the bag. The chicken leg doesn't have anything that's worth looking at. Okay. All right, so storing. So look at all the options you have for storing your dahlias. You can put them in vermiculite, in peat moss, in cedar shavings, in saran wrap, or in paper bags. Um, I choose to use vermiculite, and this is what I do. I take a Ziploc bag, I put vermiculite in the bag, and then I put the tubers in the bag, again, with the label. No label, bad thing. I do have a bunch of question marks that I don't know what they're going to be. And you notice I've got this clothespin thing here. What's that? I put this whole setup in a styrofoam cooler, you know, the ones that meat comes in or medication comes in, so that it's like this so that it's ventilated. And what this does is it creates a humid atmosphere for the dahlia and it does, they don't dry out. So they don't rot and they don't dry out. This works really well for me. Uh, I gave this lecture in February and so I, usually I don't look at my dahlias until about the um, mid-March. So I had to have something for show and tell and I went down and went through everything and I had about 100 dahlias down there and I only had about two that didn't make it. So this really, really works for me. It may not work for you. In fact, the, um, the dahlias that I get from, the, from like Montana and Washington, they all come in cedar shavings. And the dahlia lady in Hubbardston, she uses saran wrap. So it all depends. You can just take them again, put them in a paper bag and put them in the corner. Your basement has to be cool though. If your basement, you live in that basement, the dahlias are not gonna be happy. The mice that live in my basement, not a problem. Um, so it can't be too damp, it can't be too dry. Some people will sprinkle their dyes with a, a fungicide, sulfur. Some people use cinnamon as a sort of a natural fungicide. I don't use any of that. I just make sure that the uh, humidity is, is right. And this system works. I always check in February, and of, between February and March. Uh, it takes, it's really interesting, when I did this talk in February, I wanted to get these going, I wanted to get something like this, and it was really hard because they do not want to wake up until it's about 70 degrees. So I had to bring everything upstairs into my house in order to get this going so I had something to show. So here are commercial, uh, these people are, I mean, they're not commercial like Swan Island, but people who have a website, here they're storing them in shoeboxes with uh, uh, I think that's shavings. Here they are with vermiculite. Look at that. That's kind of a, that's a lot of dahlias. This is what I do. And here's the saran wrap story. Now the saran wrap story is really interesting. Uh, there is a dahlia, uh, a, a flower farmer person who has an amazing website. It's called Florette Flowers. I think I've given you the link. Some of you may be familiar. She has a YouTube video that shows you how to do this and she thinks it's really great. I've tried it, it did not work. 
So the idea is you buy Saran Wrap, not Ocean State, but Saran Wrap. It's got to be the brand name. Uh, and then you take your tuber and you roll it in Saran Wrap seven rounds. And then you cut it so that there's a little bit of air on either end. And you store it like that. And I did that and they all rotted. So I would imagine that maybe if I really tried hard to do this, I could get it to work. But when this works, why bother? Now here's a, a cardboard box. They're just put in the box. A little bit of peat moss. That works. As long as the temperature is 40 to 50 degrees. That's the, the key. Can't go f below freezing. All right, so I want to now quickly talk a little bit about dahlias in the garden because um, there's more. I, I have to tell you, the way I grow dahlias, I just make a long row and that's it. I don't get really too creative, but there are other ways to grow, incorporate dahlias into your landscape. So this is a picture taken at the Farmer's Daughter, which is a greenhouse garden center in Kingston, Rhode Island. And uh, we, we stopped there one day and they had this 50-foot border and I said to them, this is amazing. And there were lots of dark-leaved dahlias in this design, but they had a lot of other things. I wish the light was a little bit better. They had that dark ornamental kale. They had some verbena, some verbena bonariensis, a little bit of that silver plectranthus. It was a beautiful design. And I said, wow. She's the, and the woman said, well, you know, we had bulbs or we had something in that, and it got so busy, and we just sort of threw this together at the beginning of June. And this was August, and it was gorgeous. So you take the color of the dahlia and the foliage color of the dahlia, and you can design a lovely annual garden um, that will look good, I think, into the fall. So all of you are familiar with Proven Winners. I think they may sell Proven Winners here. Proven Winners has a very large farm uh, east of Concord, New Hampshire, called Pleasant View Farm. And it's where all the Proven Winners plants that you buy here are propagated. It's a huge, huge place. Uh, they have an open house every August. I was able to take the open house tour and here they are using dahlias in containers. This is a container that's probably eight feet wide, more than I think a home gardener would have, and it's got these sort of hot orange colors. They give you the recipe. They're all about recipes there. So this has super bells, a uh, million bells, a dahlia called Dalina Grand Emilio, and a lantana. And that was stunning. So again, this was a short dahlia that would combine with other annuals to create a, a pretty long-lasting um, arrangement. So last year, uh, we traveled to Scandinavia. And this is a picture of roses in bloom in June in Alborg, Denmark. And who would expect that they would have these kind of planters just as part of their municipal design? These planters were, again, eight feet wide, but almost six feet tall. They had staging. They had gorgeous annuals and cannas, and uh, it was amazing. And I looked a little further, and they had dahlias. This is the front of the town hall, uh, it was sort of a ceremonial place where people would get married. And I thought, wow, it's June in Denmark, and they've got this going. It was astounding. So you could do that. Uh, and then, of course, when you go to Aalborg, you have to go to the Troll Museum. <laughs> so another reason to go to Aalborg, Denmark, is to see dyes and to go to the Troll Museum. OK, so now I quickly want to talk a little bit about dahlia varieties. You all know about dinner plates. And when you look at the, the American Dye Society thing, a whole catalog, everything, there is no such thing as a dinner plate. So a dinner plate is something that uh, people who sell tubers want you to know that you're going to get a big one. So by definition, a dinner, dinner plate dye is eight, has a bloom eight inches in diameter. Um, but the American Dye Society recognizes blossoms that can be up to a foot in diameter. So this is the one that everybody loves. This is Cafe Olay. I tried to find it. Uh, in the, it must be sold out because it's probably the most popular dahlia. Uh, and this is a dahlia called Emery Paul, and that's a 12 inch dahlia. So, ADS classify, and I won't get into the whole thing, but they classify their blooms as giant to micro. So, this year I'm growing some micro dahlias, only about an inch and a half in diameter. 
um, but the size, this is, this is the, the size gives the letter. It's not, that's like grade A the best. It's just according to size. And then they have all these classifications. Most of the dyes that you're probably familiar with are decorative, formal or informal, or cactus, but they have a bunch of other forms. And then they have open center dahlias. And this is a, a dahlia that I never grew until last year. And the reason why I grew open center dahlias was because I wanted to grow every kind. I, wanted to, I went through the book and I grew every class of dahlia that they had. And these open centers were amazing. And the reason why they're amazing is because they were bee magnets. So if you're concerned about pollinators, you should grow open center dahlia. So they have over here, Weston is selling poo. I love this dahlia. This is considered open center. This is platinum blonde. I love that one. If I, I ordered this from somewhere. If I'd known that they'd had it, I would have bought it here. And this one is uh, called uh, Dahlia Delight Tricolor. So if you want to make your bees happy, and you have to be careful because I'll tell you, it was something else. Uh, try an open centered dahlia. So these are our um, formal decorative. You've all seen these cactus. So there are three kinds of cactus. There's incurved semi-cactus. Uh, these are called the ciniated. They're frilly or ruffly. The petals, they have a special name called ray florets, and they're, they're notched. And this is really a lovely dye to grow. It's close centered, but it's, it's a different kind of dye. Yeah? These are the balls. So we've got pom-poms, balls, and mini balls. This dye, even though it's huge, only grows to about an inch and a half. It's a really a cute, a cute little dahlia. Uh, this dahlia, actually, they sell here. I love this dahlia. It's called caramel ch chocolate. Uh, it's called, considered to be a water lily dahlia. Doesn't that flower look a bit like a water lily? It's really quite exquisite, and it grows that. It becomes that uh, chocolate red color. It's a, it's a beautiful dahlia. Um, I highly recommend it. And then this is called, uh, this is Alloway Candy. This is what they call a stellar dahlia. You see how the floral part sort of almost looks like a star or a comet? And these are, uh, are, are open centered. Uh, this is called an orchid dahlia. It has nothing to do with the orchid plant. I don't know why they named it. This is an orchette. So when you take an orchid dahlia and add these little petaloids, it becomes an orchette. This is called a collaret dahlia. It's got 8 to 16 petals and all these little petaloids. And this is called a peony dahlia. I don't know why it's called peony dahlia, but they all have open centers. They're all great for pollinators. This is the platinum blonde, which we, we have over here. And the hummingbirds can stick their little thing right in here, and the hummingbirds love that. Uh, this is a, 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 a single dahlia. It grows up to four inches, and this is called a mignon single that goes to two to four inches. And then the micro dyes this year are under two inches. So if you don't have a lot of space, you can grow these in containers and uh, have wonderful dyes. You're not going to have cutting dahlias, but you'll still have dahlias, and the pollinators will be happy. So quickly, I want to go through some special types of dyes that have been hybridized primarily by the Dutch. Um, Karma, that karma chocolate over there is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Uh, I, the, da, the gallery series are dahlias that are grown on very short plants, 12 to 20 inches, but make full-size flowers. So if you want to do flower arranging and you do not want to get all bogged down with staking and trellising, the gallery series dahlias are the ones that you should buy. Then there's something called the happy single series, and these are these opened, centered uh, they're also usually pretty short, 12 to 24 inches, eight petals, uh, a full open center. Uh, Poo is one of those. I think, well, Poo is a, considered a colorette, um, but Weston has some of those as well. Then the Karma series. And the Karma series are, um, again, um, very, very strong stems, relatively short flowers, and have been designed specifically for people who arrange flowers. So they have a very long stem on a relatively short plant. And Karma Chocolate is one of my most favorite in that series. And then the Bishop series, you've all heard of Bishop Landorf. That's been around since the 20s. Uh, they didn't do any hybridizing for about 
80 years and all of a sudden said, let's make some more bishops. So they're characterized by having these open centered uh, eight to um, 16 petals, petals and uh, very dark foliage. So this is Bishop of Lendorf. This is Bishop of Oxford, maybe Bishop of Devon. Uh, kind of fun to grow. Dahlia resources, uh, I would highly recommend. I've got all these links on the handout. You go to the American Dahlia Society website and they have Dahlia University, everything you need to know about growing dahlias. And this resource right here, um, I would not print the 92 pages, but it's got more information than you would ever need. Um, I love this book because I love the, the pictures. Uh, this is a website, Florette, uh, amazing uh, Dahlia resource. You have that. Dahlia shows. So the New England Dahlia Society has a show. Connecticut and Rhode Island, I go and exhibit at all of them. It's really fun. If I get a ribbon, that's great. If I don't, which is usual, that's also good. By participating in these shows, you become a better grower. And you learn from all the people who um, uh, exhibit. So it's always a terrific learning experience. Uh, and this is a list of all of them. So uh, there are at least a uh, half dozen, not too far from here. And then, of course, getting the ribbons, that's fun. Mm -hmm. But the thing I like most about this is that um, sometimes uh, there'll be a professional photographer. So this was one of my division winners at the New England show at Tower Hill. And uh, someone sent a link to the Worcester Telegraph, the Worcester paper, online paper. And my, my flower was um, on that website. No one knew that I grew it, but I did. And it was pretty cool <laughs> to have a professional take a picture. And then I... I uh, do water aerobics, and there's a lady in my water aerobics class who belongs to a camera club in the area, and she and her friend every fall come and do a photo shop, photo shop, photo shot in my garden. And so I get really professional pictures uh, from them. So that's it. That was great information. I can't wait to get home and plant my dahlias. This is Deb Moore for How Does Your Garden Grow at HGAT TV. Thank you.